In 1962, President John F. Kennedy said at a press conference, the Supreme Court has made its judgment and a good many people obviously will disagree with it. Others will agree with it. But I think that it is important for us if we're going to maintain our constitutional principle that we support the Supreme Court decisions even when we may not agree with them. In addition, we have in this case a very easy remedy and that is to pray ourselves. And I would think that it would be a welcome reminder to every American family that we can pray a good deal more at home, we can attend our churches with a good deal more fidelity, and we can make the true meaning of prayer much more important in the lives of all of our children. That power is very much open to us. And I would hope that as a result of this decision that all American parents will intensify their efforts at home and the rest of us will support the Constitution and the responsibility of the Supreme Court in interpreting it, which is theirs and given to them by the Constitution. We Americans are a religious people and prayer plays an important role in our lives. We have instinctively turned to God in prayer for protection from disaster, for deliverance from evil, or for the achievement of some other goal. A prayer is a reaching out on the part of the human mind to a power beyond itself. Being a predominantly Christian people, we have in our prayers followed the example of Jesus Christ. We are truthfully one nation under God, and our institutions presuppose a divine being. Those propositions are not a matter of speculation, for the First Amendment bars the federal government from enacting any law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. The 14th Amendment provides that no state shall deprive any person of liberty without due process of law. The word liberty in that clause has been held to mean the liberties guaranteed by the First Amendment. Thus the Constitution has been construed to mean that neither the federal government nor the states can pass a law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. It is the concern of the free exercise clause that every person worship as he please or not worship at all. Perhaps he's an atheist or agnostic, and if he were able to summon enough votes, he could put legal barriers in the way of the free exercise of others. No atheist or agnostic, however, or any combination of them has that power, nor may those who believe in one faith use their power to make nonconformists worship as they do. Thus, the First and Fourteenth Amendments, by making religious liberty available to all without discrimination, implicitly recognize that men have a relation to God that is in their own keeping and free from interference by others. This is tacit recognition that our regime is under God and not under the command of non-believers. There would be no place for the free exercise clause of the First Amendment in an atheistic society. Many of our institutional practices, including our oaths of office, honor the supreme being whom our religion teaches us to worship. Moreover, we are Christian because the vast majority of our people profess a Western religion, not one of the East. But that is not the reason why it would violate the Establishment Clause to require Muslim prayers in public schools. Eastern religions, whether Hindu, Buddhist, or Islam, are as much protected by the First Amendment as any other. A person cannot be put to the proof of his religious doctrines or beliefs. If he could, then heresy trials and powerful divisive forces could be reintroduced into our society. If they could, then men could be sent to jail because they practiced or taught a religion in which the jury did not believe. Truth of the religious belief, like sincerity in embracing it, is foreclosed even where the practitioners are charged with a fraudulent intrigue. Religious experience is beyond the competence of courts and juries to prove or disprove. The free exercise of religion has not been taken literally so as to include any practice a believer embraces. While religious beliefs may not be tested or challenged in court, religious practice may be. There have been in the world's history many extreme measures that have passed muster under religious practice. Human sacrifice is one. The question was raised under the free exercise clause as to the propriety of polygamy. The court termed polygamy barbarous and contrary to the spirit of Christianity and the civilization which Christianity has produced in the Western world. Thus acts deemed by the people inimical to the peace, good order, and morals of a free society can be banned, 
notwithstanding the First Amendment. Religious groups take up collections, sell religious literature, and engage in other fundraising activities. The matter was put humorously by the comedian Bob Hope, who said, once I was flying in a plane that was hit by lightning. Do something religious, a little old lady across the aisle suggested. So I did. I took up a collection. Fundraising for churches is, of course, essential to the free exercise of religion for many aspects of worshiping entail expenditures of funds. The free exercise clause is two-edged. It allows anyone to worship as he chooses, to embrace such creed or dogma as suits him, to affiliate himself with the religious group of his choice. By the same token, it allows a person to reject all faiths and to embrace atheism or agnosticism. The Free Exercise Clause is reinforced by Article 6 of the Constitution, which in part provides that no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. In the case of Torcaso v. Watkins from Maryland, a man was refused a commission as notary public because he would not declare his belief in God. The state required occupants of all state offices to make that declaration. It was held to be an unconstitutional requirement because of the Free Exercise Clause and Article 6. During the last century, when Protestants dominated the electorate, many public schools introduced sectarian education by Bible reading and otherwise. The Roman Catholics rebelled. One product of the rebellion was the increased temple for establishment of parochial schools, the constitutionality of which did not reach the court until 1925. The court held the parochial school constitutional. The idea of religious liberty, written into the First and Fourteenth Amendment, was said to exclude any general power of the states to standardize its children by forcing them to accept instruction from public teachers only. The Free Exercise Clause protects the individual from any coercive measure that encourages him toward one faith or creed, discourage him from another, or makes it prudent or desirable for him to select one and embrace it. As the Supreme Court of South Dakota once held expulsion of Roman Catholic students from public schools because of their refusal to attend readings of the King James Bible was a violation of their right of free exercise of religion. So far as government is concerned, a person can be a believer or a non-believer, a churchman or an atheist, a proselytizer or a hermit as he chooses. Occasionally, the free exercise clause and the establishment clause overlap. If the government introduces religious education into public schools, it violates the establishment clause as it puts the weight of the school system behind a particular creed, dogma, or faith. If coercion is used to get students to use a public school recess to attend religious services, then there is also a violation of the free exercise clause. It may be that religious exercise in a public school has inherent in it the element of compulsion on the non-conformist child. The free exercise clause bars the state from running church affairs. For example, the New York legislature undertook in 1945 to deprive the prelate of the Russian Orthodox Church who had been appointed by the Moscow ecclesiastical authorities of possession of the New York Cathedral and to grant possession to a patriarch chosen by an American separatist group. The purpose of the New York legislation was to protect the American churches from communist infiltration. But the court's answer was simple. Legislative power to punish subversive action cannot be doubted. If such action should be actually attempted by a cleric, neither his robe nor his pulpit would be a defense. But in this case, no problem of punishment for the violation of law arises. There is no charge of subversive or hostile action by any ecclesiastic. Here there is a transfer by statute of control over churches. This violates our rule of separation between church and state. A state legislature is not free, the court concluded to resolve religious disputes over property by applying secular standards. There are, of course, many permissible accommodations between the church and state without violating either the free exercise clause or the establishment clause. Police, who are, of course, municipal or state employees, 
direct traffic at churches or help parishioners across the street. Fire departments answer the alarm when the church is on fire. Veterans get government grants to complete their education and many spend that government money in parochial schools. Inexpensive school lunches are available under an act of Congress for both public and private school children. Private and parochial schools as well as public schools are reimbursed for the education of pages who work in the Congress and at the Supreme Court. Churches are usually granted exemption from taxation. It was accordingly held in the case of Everson versus the Board of Education that taxpayers' money could constitutionally be used to pay the bus fares of parochial school pupils as a part of the general program under which the fares of pupils attending public and other schools were paid. Many have thought that one way of establishing a religion would be to finance it. Some indeed have concluded that that would be the very best way of establishing a particular religion, just as it would be for establishing a foundation or any other institution. The court said by way of dictum in the Everson case, no tax in any amount, large or small, can be levied to support any religious activities or institutions whatever they may be called or whatever form they may adopt to teach or practice religion. The allowance of fringe benefits to students of parochial schools, however, was thought by a majority of the court to be in quite a different tradition. It was in this setting that the prayer cases, as they are commonly known, were decided. The prayer cases arose as follows. In New York, a school board acting on the recommendation of the Board of Regents, directed the school principal to cause the following prayer to be said aloud by each class in the presence of a teacher at the beginning of each school day. Almighty God, we acknowledge our dependence upon Thee, and we beg Thy blessings upon us, our parents, our teachers, and our country. The parents of ten pupils challenged the prayer requirement, saying the official prayer was contrary to the beliefs, religions, or religious practices of themselves and their children. They were Jews, Unitarians, ethical culturists, and non-believers. This suit ended in the case of Engel versus Vitale, in which the court held that the official prayer violated the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment. Next came the Abington School District versus Shemp case and Murray versus Curlett. Those cases involve laws of Pennsylvania and Maryland, and the protesting parents and children were Unitarians and atheists. Those states required readings from the Bible and recitations of the Lord's Prayer. In Maryland, the King James Version of the Bible was used. In the Pennsylvania case, the King James, the Dewey, the Revised Standard, and the Jewish versions of the Bible were used from time to time. The court held the official readings violated the Establishment Clause. Some have said that the court should have based the decision on the Free Exercise Clause, and that if it had, the decision would have been correct. But no element of coercion was in the cases. Students could absent themselves, or if they remained, they were not required to participate in the service. And there was no showing in the record of those cases that in spite of those safeguards of prayer or Bible reading ceremonies had a coercive effect on the children of the objecting parents. Every one of our colonies had to a degree some union between church and state. Some were more tolerant of religious minorities than were others. The colony of Plymouth was ruled by a governor and a small and highly select theological aristocracy, a church state with various grades of citizenship and non-citizenship. Puritan persecuted Quaker, as before him Roman Catholic had persecuted Protestant and Anglican persecuted Puritan. Anne Hutchison and Roger Williams were banished from Massachusetts. And William Robinson, Marmaduke Stevenson, Mary Dyer, and William Ladra were hanged for expressing views which clashed with the then prevailing establishment. The Salem witch hunts of 1691 are, of course, notorious. Maryland became the home of religious tolerance under the Catholic Calvert, extending free exercise of religion to all Christian sects except the Unitarians and to all others except the Jews. 
It was not long, however, before religious control changed and Roman Catholics and Episcopalians were banned. For part of the 17th century, Jews, Quakers, and Lutherans were persecuted in New York. But by the time of the American Revolution, experience had taught the new states that an accommodation of conflicting religious enterprises was essential and that the best way to assure individual liberty and fair treatment to each sect was to separate church and state. In spite of regimes of intolerance, free exercise of religion was less of a problem in the colonies and establishment, although the two were closely connected in history. Thus, when only those of a particular faith or creed could hold public office or exercise political rights, free exercise was impaired, as it was when dissenters were required to attend services of the dominant faith when only certain ministers could perform marriages and conduct burial services, some religions got preferences and the free exercise of other religions was discouraged. Thus the struggle for disestablishment of one church or multiple churches was part and parcel of the struggle for free exercise of religion. That is as true today as it was in the 18th century for the requirement of a catechism in a public school exercise will take its toll of dissenters now as then. Establishment took various forms. Penalties or disabilities on dissenters, preferences to one or more churches either as respects economic emoluments of its officials or political rights of its members, submission of dissenters to a dominant creed, and the payment of tax money to support churches. An establishment of religion can be achieved in several ways. In the Abington case, the court said, the church and state can be one. The church may control the state or the state may control the church or the relationship may take one of several possible forms of a working arrangement between the two bodies. Under all of these arrangements, the church typically has a place in the state's budget and church law usually governs such matters as baptism, marriage, divorce and separation, at least for its members and sometimes for the entire body politic. The adoption of the federal constitution in 1787 enunciated the only possible philosophy for a federated pluralistic society. The history of the First Amendment makes clear that all religions, not merely the numerous sects in the Christian faith, are included. The differences between the King James Version and the Catholic Version of the Bible are great, and the feelings concerning those differences sometimes run deep. In the mid-19th century, the Protestants were vocal in trying to keep the Bible in the public schools, the Catholics being in dissent. It seems that the play is the same century after century, only the characters changing. New Jersey in 1953 took the correct constitutional view when a New Jersey school board authorized the distribution of the Gideon Bible to students with their parents' permission. Jews and Catholics protested, claiming that the Gideon Bible is a sectarian work of peculiar religious value and significance to members of the Protestant faith. The New Jersey Supreme Court held that the distribution of the Gideon Bible was state preference of one religion over another in violation of the state and federal constitutions. That court said, to permit the distribution of the King James Version of the Bible in the public schools of this state would be to cast aside all the progress made in the United States and throughout New Jersey in the field of religious toleration and freedom. We would be renewing the ancient struggles among the various religious faiths to the detriment of them all. This we must decline to do. Whenever a state prescribes a prayer for a public school, it conducts a religious exercise violating the neutrality required of the state by the First Amendment. The secular state is a different kind of state from what most of the people of the world have known. To those who are products of the free society of the Western world, the secular state is an advanced form of government offering special rewards. 
As already noted, our choice of the secular state was a philosophical choice as well as one founded on bitter experiences. The creation of the Board of Education in New York goes back to 1842 when the legislature, unable to divide public education funds among quarreling and envious religious sects, created a public school system in which no religious, sectarian doctrine or tenet should be taught, inculcated, or practiced. Had we not lived in communities where there was a multiplicity of sects, we might have followed a different path. The secular state is advanced because it respects the conscience of every minority. It is advanced because it promotes religion more than it does sectarianism. It is advanced because it assures those who happen to make up the majority that the coercive power of government will not be used in their name to violate the conscience of any minority. Some 2,000 years ago, Jesus advised, Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. This political philosophy is a root of the present doctrine of separation of church and state that obtains in the United States. Minor Cyril Bates wrote that under an agreement with Franco made with the Vatican when he came to power in Spain, the church regained its place in the national budget. It insists on baptizing children and has made the catechism obligatory in state schools. Hugh Thomas wrote, the Roman Catholic Church in Spain dominates education, is represented on all censorship boards for TV, radio, books, and newspapers, and owns about 1,600 publications of various sorts. All schoolmasters, even in state schools, are supposed to be practicing Catholics. Efforts to give Protestants a greater degree of religious liberty have been powerfully opposed. The Church of England is in many ways an established church today. Bishops have seats in Parliament as Lords of Parliament, and as a quid pro quo, the Crown has a voice in their appointments. The religion of Islam, often associated with reactionary, if not chauvinistic, forces, became the vehicle of Arab consciousness, and from the Arabs was passed on to peoples of many races. In the world of Islam, laws are drawn in accord with Quranic principles. Church and state are subtly blended. The line between secular and sectarian authority is confused. Turkey, for some 500 years ending with World War I, was indeed governed by a council of mullahs or priests who found the general welfare within the Koran. That book, while rich in moral precepts, contains nothing concerning penicillin, mathematics, the atom, or electric energy. So it was that Turkey, peering intently into the Koran, missed the entire industrial revolution. And it took Ataturk to bring her to her senses. What Ataturk did belittled the Koran no more than the California Institute of Technology by its researches belittles the Bible. The eclipse of Turkey under sectarian control brings a shattering realization that the end product of sectarian political control can be stagnation. In sectarian circles, Hunger for secular power is still strong the world over. Implicit in most religions is a tenet of the superiority or supremacy of the particular faith and a branding of all other creeds as false. Religious groups have waged war against the infidels or heathens. Such indeed was the battle cry of Pope Urban II, who launched the Crusades and pitted Christian against Muslim in a bloody and senseless struggle. Religious communities discriminate against other religious groups in the same community. A recent episode of the kind to reach the level of world news being the action of Vietnam's Roman Catholic government against the Buddhists and its subsequent overthrow by predominantly Buddhist troops, a coup sparked in part by bitter religious rivalry. The world over the idea seems the same, that one's own religious group should be on top. For example, even today, April 24th is Martyr Day for members of the Armenian Church throughout the world. This is the date of the Turkish massacre of 1915, when the Turkish government attempted to force the Armenians to accept Islamic doctrine. 
As Congressman Sisk of California recently said in testimony before the House Judiciary Committee on the proposed Becker Amendment to the Constitution, we see here the direct and terrible climax of state-sponsored and established religion. We see a religion possessing the police and military power of a nation used to suppress and wipe out another religion. We see the awful power of religious emotion armed with political power to slaughter all those who were to them non-believers. C.J. Freund wrote, the representative Muslim believes that only Islam can regenerate the world and that sooner or later his religion will dominate all nations. Those who see Africa today in transition will see some of this enthusiasm in action. For as we started the 1960s, Islam had about 87 million African converts as compared with 22 million for Christianity. When it comes to obtaining an established religion, the Muslim is not in the minority. But he is as reluctant as any to give up any authority that is once acquired. And he is as eager as any to have his church established in whole or in part as the official religion. From a Muslim's point of view, education is a religious activity like prayer, fasting, and preaching. In the public schools in Pakistan, for example, students are required to study the Quran up to the eighth class and the opening verses are recited in Arabic each morning when school convenes. Muslims, says Rug in an article in Comparative Education, use the Quran not only as their Bible, but also as a textbook from which virtually every Muslim who can read Arabic has learned to do so. The introduction of a chant from the Quran into a school is the establishment of a part of the Islamic religion just as the requirement of circumcision would be the establishment of another part. For a state of our union to require either would flout the establishment clause of the First Amendment, which is as applicable to the states by reason of the Fourteenth Amendment as it is to the federal government itself. Yet we have in America religious groups as avid as any Muslim community to put their religious faith up front by getting state support. As I said earlier, the Islamic religion is spreading fast at a pace four times that of Christianity in Africa. It spreads here too. There are 26 mosques in this nation as of 1964. Washington, D.C. has one, and many areas have Islamic communities. Muslims occupy governmental posts, at least one having set in Congress. In time, Muslims will control some of our school boards. In time, devout Muslims may want their prayer in our schools. And if Protestant sects can get their prayers past the barriers of the First Amendment, the same passage would be guaranteed for Muslims as Islam is one of the great religions of the world. The Muslim prayer that would open our schools is composed of the first passages of the Quran, which is held in great veneration by the Mohammedans. They esteem it as the quintessence of the whole Quran and often repeat it in their devotions, both public and private, as the Christians do the Lord's Prayer. This is the passage which youngsters in Muslim nations recite in Arabic at the opening of every school day. In the name of the most merciful Lord, praise be to God, the Lord of all creatures, the most merciful, the King of the day of judgment. Thee do we worship, and of thee do we beg assistance. Direct us in the right way, in the way of those to whom thou hast been gracious, not of those who go astray. Now that prayer is pregnant with meaning. Saul's edition of the Quran gives the following explanation of it. This last sentence, he says, contains a petition that God would lead the supplicants into the true religion by which is meant the Mohammedan in the Quran, often called the right way. In this place, more particularly defined to be the way of those to whom God hath been gracious, that is, of the prophets and faithful who precede Mohammed, under which appellations are also comprehended the Jews and the Christians, such as they were in the times of their primitive purity before they had deviated from their respective institutions. Not the way of the modern Jew, who signal calamities 
are marks of the just anger of God against them for their obstinacy and disobedience, nor are the Christians of this age who have departed from the true doctrine of Jesus and are bewildered in a labyrinth of error. Our most popular religious sects do not lack a like degree of partisanship. Every student of this subject ultimately faces the disorder which the mixture of sectarian and secular authority generates, either disorder between the majority sect and the minority ones, or disorder between the church and the government, sometimes leading to the latter's overthrow by the former. It is discord between the sects with which we Americans have been most frequently concerned. Once public school prayers are the prize, a bitter contest is on for control of the school board. Only those who have gone through that political experience know the full depth and power of religious animosities. School boards have been torn asunder by contests over whose prayer will be said in the public schools, whose catechism will be read. Religious contests over secular power have been among the bloodiest in history. And even when free of blood, they have no equal in emotional content unless it be a racial argument. The First Amendment and the ban on the test oath were designed to keep religion from being a divisive force. Tolerance of all religions, preference for none, were the means whereby harmony was to be created out of diversity, where a multiplicity of sects was to create community and national unity. The broader the support for a non-denominational prayer, the greater the likelihood that the groups at either extreme will be offended. The very religious will find it at best meaningless, at worst contrary to their own beliefs. Rabbi Edward E. Klein testified at the hearings before the House Judiciary Committee on the Becker Amendment as follows. I think one can find Jewish theological principles in the Lord's Prayer but the mere title of the Lord's Prayer as the Lord's Prayer, indicating the Lord as Jesus, would make it unacceptable for Jews. There is no prayer, really, in the Jewish literature that occupies the role that the Lord's Prayer does in Christianity. It is a beautiful prayer. It can be traced to Jewish sources, but it has become the central prayer of Christianity and would not be acceptable because it has become the prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ. Edmund Kahn stated, the American principle of separation of church and state has never rested exclusively on secular grounds. The danger was not only in a secular state, but to religion itself. As Kahn said, considering the overwhelming power and resources of the modern state, the church and religion need the protecting shield of separation today much more than the state itself. Kahn goes on to point out an advantage in the secular state that is commonly overlooked. It is protection accorded the majority as well as the minority. The First Amendment, he says, makes it ethically safe to belong to the majority. By separating church and state, it assures the rarest and perhaps the most excellent of all civil rights, the constitutional right not to persecute. Separation of church and state is indeed necessary for a pluralistic society. Then the state is unable to judge in religious matters and the church is incapable of judging in political matters. All sectarian groups flourish because none sits in authority over the others. If religious and political considerations come into conflict, the political agencies resolve them. For the political agencies, not a church group, represent all the constituents in society. The Reverend Edward L. Pete, a Methodist of Haywood, California, reminded us of the consequences of the alternative course. In the historical separation of church and state, he said, as interpreted by the Supreme Court, the churches of America have prospered as nowhere else in the world. Go to Latin America and to Spain, where the churches have compelled the state to take sides in religion and to propagate religion in every way. And there you see the churches in full retreat and Christianity a byword for reaction and tyranny. Go to Scandinavia, he said, for there have been state churches for generations and religion in the schools, and there the churches are empty. 
The public school is a tax-supported institution, and no religious exercise can be devised to satisfy or to please the many kinds of American taxpayers. Some of these are Christians, Catholics and Protestants, some are Jews, some are Buddhists, and some are from the 35% of Americans who make no religious profession at all. I say, keep religion out of the schools and put it into the homes and encourage the churches to promote it everywhere. The school as instrument of the state is and must be religiously neutral. No other way is decent or practical in pluralistic America. All compulsory religion, and this would be compulsory on all children, is a denial of the spirit of Christian love. Here in the classroom, for example, are children from non-Christian homes or from homes where there is a sincere opposition to religion. Is it right to force them into our mold? Is it right to expose them to the ridicule of other children because they don't go along? And any of it could do harm to the very Christian cause we so zealously support. From the very beginning, our multi-religious community has had many debates, some of them acrimonious. They have largely concerned matters on the domestic scene. In the months and years ahead, they will increasingly implicate foreign affairs. For there are, at all times, many who would openly or covetly merge church and state, and they act with the greatest patriotism abroad, the better to combat communism, they think. Future policies concerning church and state at home and abroad make it imperative that we all become immersed in the history of the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment. There is enough mucilage to hold our society together without the regimentation of any particular theological doctrine. Christianity has sufficient inner strength to survive and flourish on its own. It does not need state subsidies, nor state privileges, nor state prestige. The more it obtains state support, the greater it curtails human freedom. For what the Roman Catholics, the Baptists, or the Presbyterians can command of the public treasury or another public support, so in time can the Moslems or the Mormons as they grow politically stronger. The nonconformist, he who belongs to a dissenting sect or who worships in a more esoteric way or whose relation to the universe has only philosophical moorings, pays the price when public institutions which he supports promote sectarian purposes. As to prayers in public schools, we should remember that public schools are supported by all sects, non-believers as well as believers, by minorities as well as by the majority. In America, public schools have a unique public function to perform. They are designed to train American students in an atmosphere that is free from parochial, sectarian, and separatist influences. The heritage they seek to instill is one that all sects, all races, all groups have in common. It is not atheistic, nor is it theistic. It is a civic and patriotic heritage that transcends all differences among people, that bridges the gaps in sectarian creeds, that cements all in a common unity of nationality, and that reduces differences that emphasis on race, creed, and sect only accentuate. 